Hi there, I'm JP Dice. Welcome into Beyond the Briefing, where we talk aviation weather. And this episode, I want to deal with something that plagues a lot of folks. We've already discussed it to a certain extent on a previous episode, but on this episode, I want to revisit check ride weather. There's a lot of anxiety that goes into check rides. I'm number one. I get the anxiety too. Been there many times. But weather seems to be a problem point for a lot of students. It really shouldn't be. We're going to make things a little bit more simple for you in terms of the check ride and what the examiner is likely looking for in this particular episode. So METARs and TAFs and how to decode those, that's on a previous episode. In this episode, we're going to go a little bit deeper. Let's talk about some things. Updated weather for check rides and what your examiner might ask you. METARs and TAFs, a little bit of information about METARs and TAFs and what you can expect and what you really need to know about those besides the decoding the information. Sources of weather information, where do you get all the weather information for a flight? Your examiner may ask you that. In fact, is probably going to want to know how you plan your flight and get that weather information. Basic weather maps, know what they mean, know how to interpret that information, and of course, limitations of weather data. So let's talk a little bit more about METARs and TAFs. Where does a METAR come from? Well, you have to have some weather instrumentation. Most airports have either an ASOS or an AWOS station, Automated Surface Observing System or Automated Weather Observing System. They essentially do very much of the same thing. Precipitation, visibility, wind speed, wind direction, temperature, and uh, also dew point. With this instrument, and if you look right here, I want to show you something on this particular instrument. I'm going to just kind of move my little cursor around here. That is an ultrasonic wind instrument. So there's no moving parts there. This is an older style cup anemometer that's also on this instrument mast. And then you have the weather vane that is going to give you the wind direction. Also, a couple of other things to make note of. You have this little piece of equipment. That is a precipitation type detector. It will let you know if it's rain or sleet, snow, what's actually falling from the sky. At the airports, the bigger airports that have ASOS stations, in many occasions, this instrumentation is going to be augmented by a weather observer. Where I fly out of commonly is Birmingham, and there are FAA contracted weather observers at the airport that are going to take actual observations and augment what the electronic sensors are telling them. So if there's any differences, they're going to make note of that, and that's going to go out in the, uh, in the METAR that comes from the airport. So just passing that along there. A little bit more information, and I've got some notes here that I've been taking from uh, various students on what examiners have been asking them. Uh, where do METARs come from? We're addressing that right now. And, and by the way, what does METAR mean? It's actually an acronym. It means Meteorological Aerodrome Report. Okay, if you want to impress an examiner, tell them that. Chances are they're probably not even going to know that. You say, hey, a METAR, that's a Meteorological Aerodrome Report. Just like a, a, a TAF is a Terminal Aerodrome Forecast. Okay. So, how often are these things updated? I want you to pay attention to this, what I'm about to tell you. So, if you look at a METAR on four flight or one of the electronic flight bags, uh, or even the uh, equipment in your airplane, the METAR is going to be updated every hour. Every hour you'll get a new METAR. Uh, sometimes you will get a special observation on ATIS. See, an ATIS is cut by a human. An air traffic controller is going to cut that ATIS, record their voice there, and say ATIS information, Charlie or Delta or so forth, with a few exceptions. Some of the larger airports actually have D-ATIS or digital ATIS, so keep that in mind. Still contains weather information and information about the airport. Taxiways are closed. Any kind of special notums or runway closures are going to be on that ATIS information. A METAR is not going to tell you all of that. But the ATIS will have weather information, 
plus additional information about what's going on at the airport. Now, if you call the 1-800 number, I should say a, a telephone number for the ATIS. Most airports have a telephone number that you can call and get the ASOS or AWOS information. Not always a 1-800 number. Most commonly, it's going to be just a local number. Uh, it's going to give you information every one minute, okay? Not to confuse you, every one minute is going to be what that automated voice is going to say if you call up or if you dial it up on a radio uh, and listen to one of your local airports as you come in to land, that's going to be updated every one minute. But if you look at it on the computer or on your iPad or on your uh, Garmin G1000, whatever, it's going to be uh, every hour you're going to get that METAR. So just keep that in mind. By the way, so there's no point of confusion. The ceilings that these weather stations that I'm showing you right here measure, they're measured in AGL. So if the ceiling is 1,000 broken, that's going to be AGL. Most things in aviation are MSL, but the ceiling height is AGL, very much like visibility. Horizontal visibility is measured in statute miles. But you know what? It's not always in miles. Some airports actually report visibility in RVR. That's runway visual range. There's certain equipment that enables measurement in feet. So you may have an RVR of, say, 1,600 or 1,800. That's going to be 1,800 feet horizontally. So that's runway visual range. Keep that in mind. A lot of airports are not going to have that. Bigger airports will be reporting that information, especially airports where airlines come in. So that is given in feet, the RVR. So a little bit more about the TAFs. The TAFs, and I'm going to go to a different graphic here. I want to show you something. Uh, what we're looking at there is a weather page, a weather tab, so to speak, on ForeFlight. And what you're going to see there is a METAR, a TAF, MOS, and wind information. What you're looking at, when you look at MOS, it looks very similar to what you have with a TAF, but it's different. MOS information is actually from a computer, model output statistics. What MOS is telling you, it's, it's raw model data. No human hands are touching MOS. It's going to go out uh, farther in time than a TAF. It's going to go out, you know, several days. It's going to look very much like a TAF, but just to keep in mind, this is just raw computer data. It is not legal information. When I say legal, if you're planning your uh, alternates, you can't go off MOS. You have to go off TAF information. TAF is actually a forecast, terminal aerodrome forecast for a specific airport and it is produced by a National Weather Service meteorologist working on the aviation desk at the local National Weather Service office to that airport. So a TAF is issued four times daily at six-hour intervals. Those forecasts are valid up to 24 hours. So keep that in mind. Moss has no human interaction. A TAF is a forecast that is created by a National Weather Service meteorologist. And speaking of National Weather Service meteorologist, there's something that you should be looking at. If you're not doing this, and tell your examiner that you also look at this. You look at the forecast discussion from the, the local National Weather Service office. So that would include your point of origin, but also the point of destination of your flight. Look at that discussion, and that discussion is going to tell you what the meteorologist at this specific office are thinking. So there's the National Weather Service office. This is a picture inside the Mobile, Alabama National Weather Service office. Meteorologist in there working. You have a designated person handling aviation. And that's what uh, the discussion would look like. It's going to take an uh, in-depth analysis of, of what the meteorologists are thinking. And it really gives you some great insight because sometimes the meteorologists will talk about, hey, you know, I'm not specifically confident in this model or in this forecast, or I think the clouds may linger a little bit longer. There's some caveats to what's going to be happening in the forecast. That discussion is going to let you know all about that. So, Keep that in mind. Also, your examiner wants to know, can you read a weather map? 
Uh, this is a weather map very similar to what uh, we, we used to show on TV all the time. You don't see this as much anymore. Isobars and all of the different what we call surface features. So we have cold fronts on there, warm fronts. We have troughs. A trough is an elongated area of low pressure. We've got highs and lows. Of course, we remember low pressure is associated with cloud cover. It's associated with stormy weather. High pressure is associated with better weather, usually sunshine or maybe some scattered clouds. But high pressure is good. Low pressure tends to be more challenging flying conditions. So let's talk about some of those fronts that you have there. You have a warm front, an occluded front, a stationary front. Can you see what I'm talking about? and a cold front. Be able to label every one of those. Take a weather map and be able to pick out every single one of those. Uh, can you do it if I take the labels away? Warm is easy to remember because it is orange or red indicating warm air. Cold is pretty easy. It's the triangles that are blue. And alternating red and blue. That's a stationary front. That's a front that's kind of just stalled out. It's not moving. Pretty easy to remember. Associated with kind of showery type weather, lots of clouds. And then you have an occluded front. That is the purple one. That's going to be a warm front catching up with a stationary or a cold front. The most significant weather in terms of adverse flying conditions, that's going to come from a cold front because that's where you typically have the pretty stormy weather. Uh, you have a lot of uplift. You have that colder air lifting up that warmer air and producing thunderstorms, squall lines, or what we call sometimes in the weather business QLCSs or quasi-linear uh, convective systems. So keep that in mind when that examiner asks you about the different fronts that are on this weather map. And the, the lines, those are isobars, that's areas of equal pressure. That's where you would see some stronger winds when you have those bars or those lines really close together. That means a tight pressure gradient, and it would typically be a lot windier when you have that going on. So where do you get all this information? Aviationweather.gov is a great source of weather information. Also, 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF is a great source of weather information. You can get that on the phone. You can also get it online. That's 1-800-WX-BRIEF, and that is a, an outside contractor to uh, the FAA that helps in really administering all of this weather data, kind of uh, coordinating it all. And you can get a complete flight briefing from those sources. So you can go there, put in your destination, your origin, and come up with a weather briefing that's going to contain all of the different information. If there's going to be SIGMETs, convective SIGMETs, if you're going to have AIRMETs, of course, we've learned AIRMETs are for the smaller aircraft. The SIGMETs include everybody. So convective SIGMETs, of course, something that you certainly want to stay away from because you may have some very active weather. Keep in mind, a, a SIGMET uh, may be issued for later in the day and, and the weather actually be pretty decent the first part of the day and that SIGMAT is for later in the day. So it doesn't necessarily mean the trip is off, but you need to know when that nasty weather or that stormy weather is going to be expected. All right, weather brief we're talking about from ForeFlight or your favorite electronic flight bag, radar apps. You can also use radar apps as a wonderful tool uh, for getting weather information while you're on the ground. For example, one of my favorite go-tos is a radar app called Radar Scope. It's a fairly inexpensive radar app, about 10 bucks a year, includes high-res data and all of the National Weather Service NEXRAD products. So I happen to really, really enjoy using Radar Scope uh, when I'm about to take off and I see there's some active weather. I'll use Radar Scope quite a bit. In the air, of course, you would have access, uh, many of you, to the in-cockpit data link weather. Uh, example, you have Sirius XM, you have FISB or the ADSB weather data. Keep in mind, this data that you're seeing on the screen is delayed. It's a little lower resolution. What it is, it's a mosaic. It's, it's a bunch of radar imagery put together to show you the big picture. So this is more strategic 
and not tactical. The examiner is going to want to know, do you realize this is delayed weather information? It may be upwards of 10 minutes or so old. So make sure you convey that to your examiner that the next rad data can lag a good bit in the cockpit of the airplane. It's still very useful information, but it is not going to be as current as what you're looking at on the ground or what uh, air traffic control is telling you or what even a, a storm scope. Uh, remember the uh, strike finders? A lot of times in older airplanes before we had a live radar, these strike finders would be installed. You'll still see them on older airplanes for sale that actually detected the lightning that was ahead of you. So that strike finder actually was real-time information. Still pretty handy if it works in your airplane. It's still a great source of uh, weather information to go along with everything else that you may have at your fingertips. And of course, you can't beat a live weather radar that's uh, available in some more advanced airplanes. Usually that's out of the budget for most uh, general aviation aircraft, but some I've flown uh, Piper Mirages, I've flown uh, Diamond DA-62s and 42s that have radar. So you still run into some aircraft that are, are good solid GA planes, some of the, the multi-engine planes, some of the, uh, the Barons and so forth do have radar in the nose of the airplane. So that's handy information as well. So a lot of information there. What your examiner really wants to know is... Are you looking at a, a really a complete weather view? What's happening at your, your area of origin along the route and where you're going and also not exceeding your personal minimums? That's a big thing. The, the examiner always wants to make sure you take this weather information and you really convey a mindset of safety. Something on the, the lines of, yeah, I, could, I can do this legally, but I probably wouldn't because I'm in a single engine airplane and the ceilings are too low or something like that. So just keep that in mind. These are some of the questions and, and some of the, the issues that have come up with folks on check rides and they've been feeding back to me uh, what examiners have asked. So make sure you know this. By no means is this the complete uh, amount of weather information that the examiner may want down verbatim, but this is some of the critical information. Also, kind of a tidbit, if they ever ask you on a METAR what the dollar sign means on a METAR, that means the system is down for maintenance. That is a maintenance uh, remark there when you see the dollar sign. Pretty easy to remember. You think dollar sign, maintenance, cost money, right? Anyway, beyond the briefing, glad you could check us out. I'm J.P. Dice. Hope you'll join us next time and great luck on that check ride. We'll see you later.